Okay, welcome back. Uh, thank you very much for the, the great discussion so far. Uh, we shall continue along the same lines, I'm sure. Uh, we have uh, prepared a session that builds on, on many of the topics that were very close uh, to Jim Marsh's own uh, intellectual contributions, specialization, attention, search, but also extend them by developing and relying on methods that were less common back in the day than they are nowadays. So all papers built uh, on different types of experimental techniques, natural experiments, uh, lab experiments, lab building on uh, more cognitive sciences kind of methods, a more traditional action kind of uh, behavioral experiment. Uh, thank you very much for to the authors to, to be here and share this time uh, with us. Uh, we'll ask each uh, presenter to present their paper in, in 10 minutes uh, consecutively. So we'll take questions and discussion at the end of the, the last presentation. Please remember to uh, upload your questions on the, the polling tool that we use also for, for the panel. And then we'll pick questions from, from there uh, at the end of the third presentation. As a sequence, I would follow the uh, list, the sequence that we had in the program. Uh, Julian first, then Francisca, and then uh, Shin, that I have seen now on the video. Is it okay with everyone? If so, I would ask then to Julien, please uh, open the session. Very nice. Uh, can you all see my slide? Yeah. Very nice. Well, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you very much to the organizers for, uh, for inviting me, uh, and I guess for being willing to define experiments broadly enough for me to, to participate. Um, because I, I won't be quite talking about a uh, controlled lab experiment here. Uh, I'll be talking about a natural experiment uh, that happens in a, in a setting that is very stylized, but which I've been really quite excited about because I think it allows me to come pretty close to the ideal uh, at least reasonably close to the ideal control experiment for what I'm uh, interested in looking at, uh, with the added benefits of, of pretty high-powered incentives, uh, without me having to pay for those incentives, which is which is an added benefit. Um, given the session's theme, I'm going to try to go relatively fast over the front end, so we have enough time to uh, to talk about well the the natural experiment itself. Uh, I just want to make sure that I that I spend a little bit of time telling you well what I'm looking at and why I think it's interesting. Um, as you can see from the title, I'm, I'm interested in how social networks affect the division of labor, uh, which is a pretty broad title. Really what I'm gonna be looking at specifically is in a temporary team where people are allowed to self-select into the tasks that they're going to be working on, are two people more likely to select tasks that are interdependent if they know each other from having collaborated before? That's, that's what we'll be investigating. Um, and I think this is an interesting question um, for, for many two reasons. First, simply because there are lots of organizations uh, where work is temporary and organized into projects. There's also, at least it seems like there's more and more organizations where people are allowed uh, to decide for themselves which tasks they want to, they want to work on. And I think this is, this is also especially interesting when it comes to task allocation, because I think these settings potentially reverse the temporal ordering that we usually assume between task allocation and the process through which people uh, learn to work together, learn to coordinate together uh, and build routines. And what I mean by that is that in quote unquote traditional organizations um, where people would typically uh, work together in the same team or group for, for an extended period of time and perhaps work on the same task for, for a significant period of time, we would typically think of, of task allocation coming first and collaboration and the elaboration of routine coming second, right? We typically think of a setting where some sort of manager is going to allocate different tasks to different people uh, because different tasks are interdependent with each other to different extents. This is going to create different levels of interdependence between different members. The members who are interdependent actually need to coordinate and as they coordinate and interact with each other, they tend to develop familiarity. They might develop routines, which hopefully creates this kind of virtual circle where as people coordinate more, they develop more familiarity, which then in turn helps them coordinate better. Um, now, this only works if membership in, uh, in teams or in groups is stable enough, right? Because, because that's how people get enough time uh, to build the familiar and familiarity or routines that they need to coordinate with each other and interdependent tasks. What's interesting about temporal work, I think, is that it might actually reverse that ordering in that 
we don't have the time for those familiarity and routines to be created. And what I'm going to be arguing is that in those types of um, of, uh, of settings, it might actually make sense to take familiarity and routines that have been established through prior collaboration as the prior to task allocation. It might actually make sense for uh, people who have co collaborated together in the past to work on inter interdependent tasks, to select interdependent tasks, because they'll be better at coordinating upon the interdependencies that they'll have. Uh, and what's interesting, in my opinion, about looking at this specifically in the context of, uh, of groups where people can self-select into tasks is that we get to ask, well, do they? Right? Do, do they seem to, be, to, to follow this principle? Do prior collaborators tend to self-select into tasks that are interdependent? And to the extent that they do, can we find evidence that they're actually doing this uh, in order to coordinate, to coordinate better rather than, for instance, uh, enjoying working interdependently with people that they've, they've uh, worked together in the past? And can we understand a little bit about the factors that, that lead them to be more likely to do that in some context than others? Um, those aren't probably the, the, you know, the, the most complex questions to ask in the world. Uh, empirically, they can be hard ones to investigate because we need visibility over quite a few things and we need hopefully exogenous variation on things that are typically hard uh, to observe exogenous variation in, right? We need, we need to have visibility over a history of prior collaboration between people. Uh, hopefully, we want exogenous variation in prior collaborations among people, which you know, in, 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 the network, in the network literature is, is, a, is a pretty pretty tall order. Right? Typically, we see, prior collabor we see collaborations evolve endogenously in the same setting in which task, task allocation is going to occur. Uh, and if we're really lucky, we'd like to see some exogenous variation in, in moderators that are going to allow to, tell, to, 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 to ascertain a little bit whether uh, people follow the pattern that I've, been, that I've been talking about because they want to coordinate and not for some, some other reason. Um, and this is where uh, esports, the, the setting in which I'm, 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 I accept my study, uh, really comes in. Um, esports is a fascinating setting for 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 a large number of reasons. This is a pretty short presentation, so I'll, so I'll, so I'll, so I'll, I'll, I'll define it as as quickly as I can. Esports is basically a setting where people play video games for a living. Uh, they play those video games in teams, um, and they make a relatively good living based on that. I'm going to be to be focusing on players uh, who play at the highest level, who, who, who often play in the, kind of, you know, in the kind of stadiums you see on this picture here, uh, which, you know, which are pretty much similar to, to what you would see in regular sports, uh, just with people playing video games, um, which is useful for my, for my purpose because we can make a pretty safe assumption that those people are actually trying to perform well, they're not just having fun. Um, and the task structure we're going to be looking at in terms of the specific game that I'm that I'm looking at uh, is quite useful for my purpose because we're going to see a setting where people play games in teams of five players who typically play uh, against another team, and more importantly, this is a setting where people specialize into roles, and roles have have different levels of interdependence with each other. I'm not going to get too much into this, the, the technical details of that, but basically by following people as they play the game on the on the on, on, on the map. I can tell whether they're playing roles that are strongly interdependent and where, they, where, they, where they're going to need to coordinate very, very strongly together, or roles that are a little bit more independent, where this kind of uh, you know, high bandwidth coordination is going to be less uh, important. And that's really what I'm going to be predicting. In a, in a newly formed team, where people self-select into the roles they're going to play, are they more likely to um, to uh, to choose highly interdependent roles if they know each other from having from having worked together in the past, and this is where another I think advantage of this setting uh, comes in, in that players play in actually two different settings. On the one hand, they play in tournaments uh, with teams whose membership is relatively stable. So people, so players are going to stay together for, for a significant period of time, a little bit as what you would see, see in, in regular sports where people you know, work long enough together that they have the time to build familiarity, to, be, to build routines together. Um, and, and I'm going to see another um, setting where those same players that I can follow in this professional tournament setting are going to be randomly allocated to a team for just one game. 
uh, which is very practical practical for me because 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 out of this random variation, uh, I'm gonna see some teams where just out of out of randomness, some players who have played professionally together in the past are gonna be allocated to the same team, and I'm gonna be able to see whether this makes them more likely to choose roles that are highly highly interdependent. Which is which is which is pretty neat from the point of view of of studying the impacts of, of prior networks because this is really difficult even to do in the lab right actually actually building social relationships in the lab is quite is quite difficult here I have the luxury of of seeing prior relationships that are relationships established over a long period of time where people really learn to collaborate together being randomly allocated in a, in a, in a different setting where people work together for a short period of time. And, and make decisions about the, the division of labor. So let's see what we see in this uh, in this um, in this setting in terms of the of the results. I'll go relatively quickly quickly on it, but first we're seeing that the, the pattern that I was arguing about that we see prior collaboration collaborators choose uh, being more likely to choose interdependent roles uh, really holds. We see we see the probability in the in the in the data. Um, we also see some effects which I won't have the time to go in detail into, but which which tell us some some like two two additional interesting patterns that I that I that I was interested in. First, it seems like you know, we we're getting some evidence that that players aren't just choosing interdependent roles, uh, you know, because they enjoy doing it. For instance, like there seems to be evidence that they're doing this strategically to get better better coordination to be to be more effective at coordinating in interdependent roles because in situations where this coordination would be more would be expected to be more uh, valuable they're even more likely to exhibit the pattern that I'm looking at the other thing that I'm seeing which I, I thought was quite interesting is that we, there seem to be trade-offs between the immediate benefits of coordination and potential future benefits from learning from new collaborators the idea being that when I choose to work interdependently with, with people who I know from before, I get coordination benefits because I already have routines with them. But at the same time, working inter interdependently with someone I've never collaborated <laughs> with in the past gives me more visibility over the way they're working and might enable me to, to, to learn something new about the task environment that I'm in. And what I see in the data is that in situations where those benefits are more likely to be, to, to, <laughs> to be, to be effective, uh, I'll see players being less likely to choose interdependent roles when they have collaborated in, in the past. Um, all right, so this was yeah. a, a relatively a relatively short presentation, but I think we have some 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 insights that are that at least I find I find pretty exciting. First, the simple idea that when work is temporary, it might actually make more sense to take prior, prior collaboration as an input to task allocation rather than than thinking of task allocation as coming earlier than collaboration. I think it's quite a, quite a, quite an interesting quite an interesting um, idea. And, and the, the, the setting in which I'm, I'm, I'm setting my study really allows me to look at whether when people divide the labor and allocate tasks through consensus, whether they're, they're, they're likely to exhibit the kind of behavior that I, was, that I was talking about. And we see that, yes, prior collaborators are more likely to choose interdependent roles, but they seem to trade off the benefits of coordination with, with potential benefits from learning from new collaborators. And all these insights, again, are enabled by the fact that I'm that I'm looking at a setting esports where I can have pretty good a pretty good availability of observing behavior and observing the division of labor, but also where I see this natural experiment where those prior collaborations are basically randomly allocated to a to a new team. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Ten minutes is super tough. Very well done. Uh, please remember to post your questions to Julien on the on the poll, please. As we go along, uh, Francesca, please. Thank you. Just one sec. Okay, can you see my slides? Yes. Okay, perfect. Yeah, so uh, thank you very much um, for organizing this event, um, at least in this uh, virtual space. And I'm super excited to be part of the session on uh, experiments and the behavioral theory uh, of them. Um, so I would like to present uh, to you a particular kind of experiment that is an eye tracking experiment um, that I conducted together with my colleague, uh, Stefan Billinger. And we study the question of how guiding search with incentives shapes attention and then eventually exploration. And in this short presentation, I'd like to present to you um, the idea of how I think uh, experiments, and in this particular case, uh, eye tracking experiments may further our understanding of these micro-level processes in the behavioral theory of the fund. 
So let me start with saying that uh, search is, of course, not only a key component of the behavioral theory of the firm, but also a key process in, in many organizations. Um, a way to also then uh, facilitate and, and one potential outcome is to achieve uh, exploration. And while organizations might have um, this, this goal of uh, achieving a certain level of exploration, organizations might also need to guide search behavior. And this could be because when lower level agents that could be individuals or departments engage in this um, search process, then uh, the organization might still want to align these um, search attempts with their overall strategy, but also might need to coordinate actions between individuals or departments. So one way to think about this could be an R&D process where um, several uh, materials can be used to create a new product. And now the organization uh, would like to use one material more often because this can be sourced internally or a different um, side of the argument could be uh, that one material is, for example, particularly carbon intense, and the organization, um, once in its overall strategy, uh, like to achieve to, to use this one less. So one way to guide search um, or, or constrain search um, is uh, suggested by Dan Leventhal and Maciek Wojciewicz and their work um, where they suggest that uh, constraints can be set so that a higher level uh, manager um, uh, only allows uh, lower level um, agents to search a subspace um, or subset of solutions. And we want to suggest a, a different um, kind of way to guide behavior, and that is uh, through incentives, where still the whole uh, um, space of solutions is available, but some uh, solutions are just more attractive than others. And using the terminology um, of the attention-based view, one could think of uh, these incentives as setting um, a formal way of setting the, the rules of the game. Now, if the organization interferes and, and guides this uh, search, these search attempts, then uh, it's still important to think about how is exploration as an, um, as an outcome potentially affected. And we think there are two potential ways in which uh, exploration might be affected. The first is more of a mechanical or technical explanation. So if search is guided towards a subset of solutions, then fewer combinations are only considered. And just by the fact that uh, fewer combinations are considered, uh, search might become less explorative. Now we are interested in a more, uh, I'd say, behavioral um, mechanism. That is the idea that if incentives are implemented, the incentives themselves may attract attention. So a decision maker might consider uh, whether to respond to these incentives or how to respond to them and um, include it in the decision making and thereby incentives attract attention and might eventually um, also distract uh, the decision maker from engaging in more explorative search attempts. So in this study, we want to put forward the idea of a novel attention based mechanism to explain differences in search behavior. And just um, to highlight again our methodological choice. So um, while I think that um, this first um, uh, mechanism could ideally be studied in a theoretical model, especially for this uh, second more behavioral um, mechanism. Um, we actually need uh, experiments, or in this case now an eye tracking experiment to um, yeah, better understand this attention-based mechanism. So what exactly do we need? Um, we need a combinatorial multi-attribute search task because we are interested on the one hand in the explorativeness of search, but also we want to vary incentives um, of one particular attribute. And in our case, um, of so one attribute of this, this multi-attribute search task. We, um, we want to vary these incentives in different ways. So we have different treatments with different incentives because for this attention-based mechanism, it might be important whether the decision maker is affected positively or negatively and affected personally or, only, or others are affected. So I'll show you the treatments in a second. And then we need a direct and objective measure of the tension. And um, yeah, we can fulfill all these requirements in a laboratory eye tracking experiment where we use these eye tracking um, devices. Um, and um, then uh, the experimental task we use is uh, the alien game where participants can recombine uh, six uh, attributes um, in their attempt to find the best um, possible solution of these um, uh, of these. Uh, six geometric sh shapes with which they can create a piece of art for an alien in, in 12, um, um, yeah, this, this, um, 12 decisions. 
So the underlying performance landscape is an NK landscape where we set the uh, complexity level to two. And then um, participants are incentivized by the best configuration and additionally by uh, a bonus that is created um, whenever they use this one particular attribute um, and these incentives are created. The kind of incentives depend on, on the treatment conditions they are in. So we have a control condition without any incentives. And then there are um, conditions where participants, whenever they use uh, this, um, this attribute, create negative incentives for themselves. They are shared with others or only others are affected. And the same thing happens for positive incentives. I think perhaps it, comes a bit, it becomes a bit clearer if um, we take a look at the experimental interface. So in this example, a participant is in the round four of 12 decisions and can select um, and deselect any of these uh, six geometric shapes. And the third attribute that is a shape of a star, a bit hard to see perhaps, um, whenever this is selected, then this additional incentive uh, is created. And we optimized this uh, experimental interface for the use of eye tracking and these squares that you can see would be then uh, represent an area of interest and we could measure later on um, how long, how often and which order participants looked at these particular areas. And in the lower part of the screen, you can see that participants see their uh, own performance they achieved and also the incentives that were created. So what are the variables we are interested in? First of all, we want to know whether these uh, incentives actually uh, guide uh, um, individual search behavior. So whether um, participants search among the subset of incentivized or disincentivized um, solutions. This is more of a manipulation check, I would say. But then we're interested in exploration. We measure this um, as um, based on search distance that is um, also referred to the um, Hemming distance, so we are interested in how many changes um, in these attributes people made compared to uh, the most uh, successful previous combination. And additionally, for our measure of attention, we are interested in whether participants paid more attention to the decisions themselves or relatively more attention to the performance implications. And I'll just show you um, one example of a heat map, a map of a participant. On the left hand side, there's one who paid relatively more attention to um, the decision task. And then on the right-hand side, you can see um, somebody who paid um, in this round more attention to the performance uh, implications. So more than 200 participants were uh, um, um, allocated into these different treatment conditions and they were incentivized um, monetarily. What do we find? First of all, incentives work and participants in the control condition use the um, attribute on average 50% of the time. And um, when people were exposed to negative incentives, they used this attribute less. And when they were exposed to positive incentives, they used it more. But now more importantly, what happens with exploration? So we can see that in some, under some incentives, exploration seems to be affected and is lower than in other conditions. But it was a bit hard to understand why exactly this was going on. And then diving into our uh, eye tracking data, we could find that or could see that in, under some um, incentives, um, it plays a role where the participants paid their attention to. And whenever a, a decision maker was affected negatively or others were affected positively, paying more attention to the performance implications of the incentives led to um, to um, less search distance. So it seems that under these incentives, um, the, the main effect is driven um, by this um, focus of attention. So just to give you a short glimpse of, of the results. Um, so under these particular kind of incentives, search distance is uh, significantly lower. Um, and there's also an, an influence of the performance focus. So this is like the focus of attention and how we called it. Um, but still, when this um, and all the many other control variables are included, we still have a significant main effect. So to sum up, um, we can say that, first of all, incentives um, guide search towards our way as um, a subset of solutions. And um, as our main result, we'd like to highlight that search is only less explorative under some incentives. So. This means that only the technical or mechanical explanation wouldn't explain our findings. But then we can see that depending on the incentives, um, 
the, um, uh, it depends on, on the kind of incentives, um, whether search is less exportive. And in our findings, we have a, a suggestion for a uh, intention-based mechanism that can help us now understanding these differences uh, in search behavior. And so um, this may contribute um, a novel mechanism that is relevant to understand these micro foundations and the process of search and in the behavioral theory of the firma generally, and perhaps also complement this recent um, modeling work on, on uh, constraining search and guiding search. And um, then I think for, for um, the um, attention literature and the attention-based view it is additionally interesting um, that yeah, we can show these very micro-level processes um, of uh, visual attention. And in our case now, these, uh, this, this eye-tracking uh, technology allows us to, to measure attention directly and objectively. So yeah, thank you very much um, for your attention. And I'm looking forward to the discussion and the questions. Thank you very much. And now, Shin. Oh, Thank you, Stefano. Thanks for uh, including me in this panel. I don't know who put it together. I assume you did, but uh, I think that I will nicely match what we just heard from Francesca and uh, Stefan and from Julien. Um, what direct search? Now, seems a little difficult to talk about research when the world's on fire, but um, I hope that our research can be relevant to current events. And um, Steve, thank you for the flag. It was noted. Let me uh, share my screen. Let's see if Zoom cooperates. All right, I'm under a strict uh, 10 minute uh, time limit. So I'll be brief, I'll keep the presentation conceptual, trying to channel Jim and his uh, variable theories, but I'm happy to talk offline about the uh, technical details. So what direct search? Uh, and if you ask any good organizational scholar, they will give you the orthodox answer. What uh, direct search is uh, disappointment. We try different things, we get feedback from the environment, and if we're disappointed, we change course, we explore. And uh, if we get positive feedback, we keep doing the same thing, we exploit. Um, this is indeed uh, orthodox theory, and what I would like to propose today is that there may be other processes at play. So this is part of a large research project that uh, involved many people around the world, even in Russia, back when it was legal, uh, to understand how people search. And what I will focus on today is the role of performance variability or performance stability, two sides of the same coin, in driving search. Now you can see me, um, I don't know if you can see my collaborators, but uh, here they are on the screen. So how do decision make your search? Well, one answer is they respond to feedback. And this strikes us as reactive. They react to new information. They react to disappointment. They react to success. Specifically, theory tells us that when the individuals are trailing their aspirations, they turn to exploration. When they experience a gap between what they hope to receive and what they actually receive, they turn to explore. We suggest the decision makers can also search preemptively. And specifically, we suggest that if performance is stable, individuals are more likely to engage in exploration. Now, this is easier to say than to test because of the nature of the search process, which is a path dependent process with tons of endogeneity. So I'll show you how we attempted to empirically address this challenge. Now, uh, those of you that know me uh, know that I'm a proponent of uh, transparency in research. Everything that I'll present today is open instruments, open data, and some of the hypotheses are pre-registered. Let me start with performance stability, which is probably the novel element here. Why would performance stability matter? 
very briefly, this is why we think it should matter. Because decision makers attend to the reliability of evidence or feedback, not just what they receive, but how reliable is this information. And stability is indicative of reliability. A very intuitive example, I may go to a, a restaurant, which is not brilliant, but not terrible either. It's mediocre, but it's reliably mediocre. Each time I go there, I know exactly what experience I'll have. Now I'm more ready to branch out and try other places, places that I don't know yet. Hence, we hypothesize that stable performance allows decision makers to move towards exploration, but instability suggests that the evidence they receive may be unreliable, so they will stay in the same place, keep doing the same thing to gather more data, which is exploitation. Now, trailing aspirations may sound intuitive, the notion that when things don't go as you intended, you try something else. But as uh, Posen and his collaborators show in vast review of the literature published recently, this is contradicted by other well-supported theories like escalation of commitment, something that we hear in the present context often, right? The idea that precisely because things are not going well for the Russians in Ukraine, they're going to throw more forces into the war and become even more committed to the war. Well, which one is it? Escalation of commitment or trailing aspirations? Furthermore, Posen and his collaborator point out that the empirical evidence for the aspiration performance gap, that empirical evidence is actually mixed. So it's not clear that it is as obvious as we tend to assume. So we aim to take this notion that has been theorized and described qualitatively and found in archival data and following our colleagues that presented earlier, test it in the controlled environment of the lab. How do we do it? Well, uh, we do it with three studies. Uh, study one is a small one-on-one -on -one experiment in which participants engage in a tabletop simulation of search, which allows us to collect both behavioral data, but also think aloud protocols, something that Daniela uh, knows a lot about. Um, and from that, we started developing hypotheses, which we then subsequently tested on a much larger sample, more than double the size of the original sample involving almost 2,300 decisions. Now, as I mentioned, search is tricky to study because it is a path dependent process, which I, what I experienced in the previous period affects my decision in the presence, which affects the experiences that I will gather in the next period. So separating cause and effect is difficult. The way we attempted to nail down the causal process is by creating a randomized experiment in which we can randomly assign participants to history and to an environment that is either stable or unstable, highly stylized, but we hope nicely dovetails with the other experiments that are more realistic. So mindful of the three and a half minutes that I have left, I'll go briefly through the results. The first study This is what we find. When you experience an aspiration performance gap, you are vastly less likely to exploit, vastly more likely to explore. We look both at whether you keep doing the same thing and how far you search. So you're far less likely to keep doing the same thing and far more likely to take a big step and try something else. But controlling for that, performance stability also matters. When you experience performance stability, you are less likely to exploit, more likely to step away and try something else. This is a smaller sample of about 1,000 decisions. So as I mentioned, we tested those hypotheses using an online instrument that we developed, much larger sample, over uh, almost 2,300 decisions, and we replicate the results. Aspiration performance gap, yes, aspiration performance gap drives decision makers towards exploration, but performance stability has a similar effect. Now, 
it still remains that we do not know what is the cause and the effect. Regressions, even the most sophisticated ones, describe associations. They do not describe causality. A randomized experiments can nail down the causality. I'll skip the technicalities of how we attempted to keep any, everything else identical except for the experience and whether participants were above their aspiration level or below their aspiration level and whether they were in stable or unstable environment. I will go straight to the results and this is what we see. On the y-axis, the likelihood of exploitation and on the x-axis, whether participants were in stable environment or an unstable environment. And as you can see, when participants were in environment characterized by performance variability, they were more likely to exploit. When they were in a stable environment, they were more likely to explore. Briefly, some implications. So one is that, yes, decision makers react. They react to adversity, but they also seem to be capable of searching preemptively. This is not extremely surprising. We've heard about mental simulation. Dan has a memorable piece on the topic, but it hasn't been fully integrated into the theory of the firm. The notion that we react, but we also preempt. We can mentally simulate, and sometimes we may even be um, unattentive to feedback. That's also a possibility. So this is just a drop in the bucket. We think there is much more that is going on. Here we focus on stability. Um, it, because decision maker can preempt and can simulate, exploration may not be just a result of disappointment, and hence it may be more prevalent than we typically assume. And finally, as in Francesca and Stefan's study and Julien's study, we focus on individual here. And you will be perfectly right to ask, where's the organization? Well, we do not have organization in our study, but this suggests that some of what we attribute to organizations may actually emerge from individual decision makers. This is not to say that individuals uh, and organizations are the same, absolutely not, but some of what we attribute to the organization level may emerge from individual cognition. And I'm exactly at 10 minutes, thank you. Thank you so much, and thank you so much to all the speakers for the excellent timing. So we have time for questions. The, the poll has been quite enough for a few questions. So let me try maybe to summarize a few starting with Julien and then Francisca and Shin, and then people might jump in as, as we go along. So to Julien, uh, that sort of two types of questions that are receiving some attention here. Um, one is about the appropriateness of the, uh, of the setting in which you are doing, running this uh, natural experiment. Uh, again, these are sort of quasi-professional gamers, I suppose. And one question asks whether this is the idea of setting really, because if you're a professional gamer, designer, whatever, you develop routines at the field level, mm -hmm. uh, not only through familiarity in settings. This could be related to the more specific questions to the setting. There are two or three questions that are very much interested in the mechanics of your randomization process, this random allocation to different roles in, in, in the treated group, so to speak. Very nice. I think there's a yeah, there's there's a few. I was looking at the question. I think there's a few different ones that are that are along the, those um, those lines. Um, I think on the um, routines being developed at the field at the field level as well. Um, I think I mean I think that's absolutely correct. I think it is something which. Um, I, as uh, as you know, it is, is the is, is, is the case in a few different fields. We, we see specialization at the field level uh, in creative professionals, in uh, in in, uh, in uh, software engineers, in, the, in 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 a bunch of different um, settings, um, which you know, which suggests that in a way, you know, if you want to be cautious, you might you might want to uh, to to extrapolate the results I find here mainly to those settings. Um, one thing that's that's Worth noting, though, is that these are things that specialization into role is something that you can control for in this setting. I and mean, this is kind of where uh, the random, random allocation to role uh, kind of kind of plays in. Since what I'm seeing basically is just people um, 
players that are that are actually not semi-professional. They're very much they're they're professionals. The way I'm defining my uh, my sample is by restricting it to all players who have played at least once in a tournament with more than one million dollars of prize pool. So these are very much people who uh, who do this for 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 a living. Um, um what we what, what we see by having this random allocation is that we're seeing random allocation of prior collaboration but also of specialization into different roles uh and uh, and and a few different things having to do with the prior history of those players so we can actually um control for the prior specialization of players in this setting and we very much see that uh, a big uh, impact on the choice of, of interdependent roles is whether you have an interdependent specialization, for instance, which would make sense because when we think of the, of the division of labor and of task allocation, we often think of it as a problem of matching skills to task, right? So, so I'm definitely not arguing that this is something that completely goes away here. In a way, what I'm saying is that on top of that, in the types of things I'm looking at where, where, uh, where work is temporary, we might also see uh, a match of, uh, of prior collaboration history to interdependence, which can be done at the moment task allocation is, uh, is, is. Thank you. All right, let me move to Francesca. So we'll be going in cycle, if that's okay with you. Uh, Francesca, there are two questions in particular which are, which are quite popular. They're both about connections in a way. Uh, one is about it's a classic question for experimental studies, individual level. What do we learn about organizations looking at how individuals allocate visual attention? And the second one is uh, related to the attention literature. So there are many different definitions of attention, particularly the micro level. You, you focus obviously on visual attention. Uh, how does that relate to the kind of attention that, for example, Daniela, now I don't see, uh, has been studying? I mean, clearly there must be similarities, but also differences. Yeah, yeah, thank you. So, um, I mean, first of all, the question is, are we interested in individual decision making when we study organizations? And if we answer this question with yes, then I think um, we might also be interested in the cognitive processes leading to these decision outcomes. Um, and but to more generally answer the question. So I think what is important um, in our study is that the IV, so what we are, what we are interested in, what we are varying, that is um, incentives in a in an organizational context um, that we are thinking of. And um, so I think this, um, yeah, as this being an important artifact in organizations makes our context more organizational. But of course, I'm I'm totally aware of the, um, yeah, of the, the the limits of of an experiment and then of of studying individual um, decision making, but. I think it's it's uh, extremely important to understand these uh, decision making processes to then understand why um, these um, why potential measures that might be implemented in organizations may work or also may not work, and, and better understanding why they may not work. And so this is perhaps the, like um, an an attempt to to um, respond to the first one. And um, yeah, but the then question to, was on the different types of attention. Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, so I mean, probably Daniela would be the better person to answer this question and um, how this is related to her work. But so in um, in Daniela's work, she, for example, um, looks at these uh, cognitive uh, capabilities. And that is and, and one of these uh, is attention. So I think it's attention, working, memory, and the third one. And um, in, in Daniela's work, but also perhaps more generally in, um, in the literature of attention, um, this is often not about visual attention, but a broader, a broader meaning of the word attention. So spending time on something or effort on a task and um, being concerned with something um, is, of course, also paying attention to something. And we now measure one small element um, of this, um, of this attention um, concept that is visual attention. And that's probably not perfect, but allows us just um, yeah, to, to observe attention that is also um, that is separate from decision making. I think that is important because we can observe where people look at and they might end up um, making a different kind of decision. I think that's very unique um, about these uh, eye tracking devices. Thank you. Shane, one question which has been capturing a bit of attention is 
also related to this discussion about how we go from the individual to the organizational level in a way. It's about possible connection to the routines literature uh, where people have been studying different types of routines and what kind of stability they try to enforce. Some routines try to emphasize stability and performance, which I guess could be related to you know, enabling some form of search to guarantee performance, uh, while other routines are designed to actually guarantee stability in the process that probably would push to, to limit search and, and speculating. But um, I think it's a, it's a good question to see what your study can deliver to that kind of literature or learn from it. Yes, I agree. This uh, opens a lot of interesting possibilities. That, uh, I think Jim would agree that the organizations seem to be of two minds. They want stability in performance and stability in processes, something that uh, does not often go hand in hand as I uh, find myself explaining my dean. Um, we focus on stability or instability in performance. It would be interesting to take this, and I think that our instruments are capable of that, and seeing what happens when the process is stable or unstable. But we made a clear decision for analytical purposes to focus on instability in performance, instability in the feedback that we receive from the world about our efforts. So our efforts remain the same, but they result in uh, different outcomes. Thank you. Another question that I read to you that I just picked up, sorry, that my, my screen is updating, is on deception. I mean, you, you've been a champion of transparency in, in how you implement research. And I mean, I'm entirely grateful and the whole community should be, I think, for what you've been doing there as a role model. Um, there is a couple of questions here about the possible use of deception in this setting in relation to performance history uh, and other elements of the experiment. Can, could you clarify what yeah, you felt? Yeah, yeah. So, I'm happy to go into the instruments. We did not use deception, and I'm happy to, to speak online who, with whom we were interested to show them that. But I'd like to point out that deception is something of, uh, of a religious conviction, right? Uh, so economists are religiously uh, intolerate of deception, unless it's a field experiment, I hear. It's okay to deceive in field experiments, like uh, when you send CVs that are made up to potential employers. Uh, but at the same time, of course, psychologists cannot imagine how you would run an experiment uh, without deception. It's not that they advocate deception, but they're willing to tolerate it. So uh, we made a decision not to deceive in this uh, setting, but it's not something that I am religiously convicted about one way or another. Thank you. I see one hand up on the screen. Is, is that a question, Vartui? Yes, that is a question. Thank, Thank you so you. very much, Dr. Bussoni, for giving me this possibility. Thanks to all participants. And my question is directed at Dr. Sheen Levine's uh, presentation. Um, so the question is very, very simple, actually. Have you found any gender-specific differences in the reaction um, in the two settings, right? Like the performance stability versus performance instability measure setting. So is it possible that women, on average, tend to react differently in these two different settings. So we might say that like, you know, um, conjecture could be that, well, because women on average tend to be less risk loving individuals, um, they might be more likely to stick to exploitation routines in the in both settings or even in the stable set, setting. That's the first question. And another question that goes along with that is about individual differences in, in reactions, in, in behavioral uh, um, well you know, styles, right? In behaviors in these two different settings. You've mentioned that you have collected data also including Russian participants. So did you, like, do you have enough power, statistical power, enough number of observations from that part of the country? Like, could you say something about you know, international differences in, in individual responses to these two different types of settings? Messi. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much for the question. I don't know how much time I have to answer. Uh, but yes, uh, th this is a separate study. There are gender differences. And my uh, colleague, uh, Felix uh, Mausberger, who's on the call too, has been looking at differences between the way Russian search and non-Russian search and found differences there too. So perhaps we can illuminate some current events with that other study. But thank you for the question. I'm happy to uh, stick around and talk some more about it. Thank you.
so a comment uh, I think from Francisco in the chat is uh, well you can see from Daniela uh, is whether it is um, eye tracking technology is capturing top down or bottom up attention which is indeed two very different things and they have different impacts on decision making and different roles. Yeah, so I'd like to continue uh, that discussion. Um, but um, so I think in the way um, top down and bottom up attention is uh, conceptualized in, in the attention based view, it's probably important whether somebody is, uh, is um, for example, um, yeah, fixing attention on something um, that is um, important for this um, for the decision purpose so in our context for example if you want to select one of these attributes and you pay more attention to it um, then um, this is um, yeah this is for the purpose of of fulfilling the task but what we are um, what we're trying to say with the um, with this focus on um, the performance implications of the in incentives is more that uh, it, it doesn't help you in any way to pay more attention to these incentives. So it's not that you are purposing your attention on the in incentive information and this is to um yeah to to fulfill the task, but this is more um might be a sign of, of people thinking about the performance implications and considering whether it's really worth um for example using an, an attribute when it um, creates negative incentives. Um, so yeah I'm not sure. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I saw Steve okay, raise yeah. his hand on the screen. You're muted, sorry. Steve, you're still muted. Okay, sorry. I, 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 I couldn't get the, the, the pointer wasn't open in the menu. Anyway, I actually, my I, the cross-cultural question that occurred to me actually most in the context of, of the, Julian's presentation, specifically because, you know, I haven't tuned into e-games recently, but I was teaching in Korea in 2008 and the phenomenon had already gotten going. I taught some related material a couple of times in the early 2000 noughts and it still remained from my perspective, a much more East Asian phenomenon than um, Western Europe or US. I know that was shifting. And I, so I was just curious, Julian, if, if you, know, you found cross-cultural differences. That's, that's a very interesting question. That's something that I haven't looked at. Uh, this is actually, a, like the, the game that I'm looking at is actually, a, I think a pretty nice context for looking at this for someone who would be interested in it because this is very much not a game that is, that is specific with, with one specific region, right? Uh, there's, there, there, are, there are players, yeah, there's a huge clusters of players in Europe, in Asia, in America, uh, and, and, and some teams that are, that, 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 that are, that are, that are made across, uh, across cultures. Um, so, so that is definitely something that could be looked at here. I was, I was interested mostly in just the main effect of power collaboration on, on, uh, on the division of labor. Uh, this could actually be a pretty, a pretty nice, uh, setting for looking at cross-cultural differences and even for, you could even imagine like diffusion story, diffusion stories in terms of how how different styles of playing, for instance, might diffuse across clusters because you see these, these kind of interesting, almost like small world networks in terms of who plays against whom, especially in professional settings, right? Where where, where competitions might be specific to some regions uh, for some time, and then 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 players get some opportunities to play across across clusters. So for, for someone who would be interested in that, I think that's very much something that can be done. All right, thank you very much. I think we have just over one minute to 6 p.m. or to noon Eastern time. So just enough time to, to thank you all speakers for the very interesting papers and the very timely presentations. Uh, thank you everyone for all the questions. Um, I think this is the end of the first day of this special organization science winter conference. I will leave the floor to Felipe maybe to wrap up and uh, remind us about tomorrow. Just just a reminder that tomorrow is at the same time, so at 10 a.m. Eastern time, and uh, we will have an hour of a fireside chat again, talking about the past and the future of the Carnegie tradition, and then another paper session on multiple goals and aspiration levels. So it was awesome to see you all today. Thank you very much, and looking forward to tomorrow. <laughs>